welcome to Disability Viewpoints, now in our 25th year. Uh, my co-host today is Joan Wilshire. You'll see Daryl Paulson up here on the set. Uh, Joan, who's your guest today? I have three great guests. Daryl Paulson from Paulson & Company, uh, Maren Schroeder, who is one of the um, action leaders um, in the cannabis issue, as well as Lele Fetehe, um, um, lobbyist for the particular issue as well. And so it's a, a jam-packed um, time that we're going to be together talking about um, the passage of the cannabis legislation in Minnesota. It's a busy half hour, and they created a new state agency for the marijuana It's thing. fabulous. Great, great. Well, my guest today is Trevor Turner from the Minnesota Council on Disabilities, and we're going to do a pretty thorough legislative update. And so he'll be along in a minute on this very station. Thank you. Hello, I'm Mark Hughes. Welcome to Disability Viewpoints. I have a, it's a special day around here. We have Daryl Paulson on the set from Paulson and Companies. He's going to be on the next interview, but we're going to do a legislative update with Trevor Turner from the Minnesota Council on Disabilities. And uh, it's been the busiest year I know down at the House and Senate. <laughs> so Trevor, uh, welcome to the show. You know, this session, as you said, was a really, really busy session. And in fact, there, I think of the name I'm hearing is now the Minnesota Miracle 2.0, uh, with the last Minnesota Miracle was in 1973, 50 years ago, uh, which they had saw significant investments in education and things like that, which had a transformative impact on our workforce and kind of led Minnesota to go from an agrarian state to mm -hmm. the modern Minnesota economy that we have now. And now we this year in 2023, we had just as busy and, and impactful of a legislative session with significant invest investments in all over. But uh, you know, this legislative session really has roots in the 2022 legislative session. Um, you know, we saw in 2022, we didn't actually see a lot because of the partisan gridlock uh, that we saw uh, because of our divided government. Um, and we had a $12 billion surplus that was left unspent. And then that later that year, because nothing was passed, um, that surplus ballooned to an $18 billion surplus for the 2023 legislative session. So the DFL definitely wanted to take advantage of this unique opportunity. Um, the last time the DFL had a trifecta was in 2013, 2014. Um, but they were much less ambitious then because they were more concerned about holding on to power, uh, which they lost anyway. So I think that this time they learned their lesson that, you know, it's too uh, unpredictable the future. So it's best to take advantage of unique opportunities now. And so they absolutely did. And so we saw, you know, high priorities right away out the gate. And so we saw, you know, issues ranging from abortion rights protections to uh, uh, ch children lunch, uh, school lunches free for everyone. Um, we saw the uh, voting rights restored for people who had former felonies. Uh, we saw a lot of different things, and those were both of the big cultural issues that, uh, you know, Democrats had been campaigning on for a long time, and they wanted to take advantage of it. And so uh, we saw a lot of that. But then they also had this was a budget year. So they had to spend, uh, not only establish a budget uh, for the next two years, but they had an additional $18 billion to spend and invest into the state government or into the state. And yeah. so that is one of the reasons why we just saw such a productive legislative session, because, you know, Democrats wanted to get things done while they had the chance. Right. And in one, half of that money we saw go into education per Governor Walls, because obviously he's a football coach, a social studies teacher, an educator. So half of that went to that. Now, if you look at the whole session and it just got done, what were your biggest, you think, accomplishments? What were your biggest disappointments, if there were any? I mean, this was a pretty good session. It was a pretty good uh, session. You know, you know, every year the Council on Disability comes up with a legislative priority list. And, you know, normally we're happy to see two or three things pass. 
Um, and but this year, in our legislative priority, as we saw over, I believe, I think 17 different issues of ours that were included. Now, a lot of these issues were things that we had been working on for years. years. <laughs> so um, it's not like it was a brand new thing. A lot of these things were things that were just ready to go and just needed that final, uh, uh, you know, initiative to get it done. Yeah. Um, and so it, it's been great as far as our legislative priorities have been kind of wiped clean. And so now we have for 2024 have to come up with a new legislative priority list because, uh, you know, so many things were passed. And I think you know, some of the biggest things we saw, we saw major investments in personal care attendants, uh, increasing pay. Um, we saw uh, better benefits for them and in trying to increase the retention and hiring of PCAs in the workforce. Um, we saw uh, a lot of, uh, you know, even the Council on Disability, we got in a major investment in our agency. Uh, we saw about a $1.4 million increase in our budget, which we plan to use for hiring more staff to provide better programming for people with disabilities in the state and better advocacy for people with disabilities at the state. Um, and so, it, and we also saw uh, the final the passage of the uh, hiring and retention of employees with disabilities for the state. Right. Um, this was increasing uh, the goal to increase uh, the employment and retention of people with disabilities in the state, which I believe will have a transformative impact on our state because it will bring more people with disability to the governing table. And I think that when you have more people with disabilities at the governing table making disability policies, and it will improve our disability services and, and policies in the state. That that opened so, a real door. And, and by the way, an acronym for PCA, the total definition for people watching mm -hmm. home is personal care attendant. We want to be clear about that. There you go. Yes. So. Yeah. And I have another acronym for PCA. We'll talk about that in the next section. All right, very so, good. And uh, But the one thing I would like to say, Mark, as well, is we've seen the governor and we've seen the legislature make significant investments in transportation as well. And um, in the fact that we're, there's going to be a three quarters, uh, three quarters of a cent sales tax in the metro area um, on our gas, that's the first time that that's been done We've raised the gas tax in about 20 years, and that that will that will allow us to make significant improvements in in transit in the metro area. It will also allow us to implement a safety and security plan that is much needed in in several of our uh, communities where metro transit operates. I mean, we're we're making significant investments in family and children. I mean, I mean, Trevor, the list goes on and on. So I'm, I'm, yeah. glad, I'm glad to be partnering with you on many issues that the council cares about and that we care about in the disability community. What do you think your significant role was this session? You know, I think the significant win just overall was just getting the attention of the, gover the, the government and focusing on disability issues. And we really saw that this legislative session, that the, there was a high priority to you know, improve and invest in the disability community in our state. And so um, I think just overall, just having that acknowledgement, hopefully we can keep carrying that on to the next legislative session. You know, the next legislative session is the same government. We don't have uh, any elections for the House or, or the Senate or the governor next year. And so it will be the same government next year. So hopefully we can continue that momentum and continue to improve and improve on policies and investment for the state. Uh, is there anything else you want to add before we go? Yeah, so there's actually one thing that kind of happened towards the very, very end of session that, that you know, I have been watching throughout the legislative session, but it didn't really seem to have too much of a disability angle uh, until the very, very end of session, and that was the Uber and Lyft bill um, by Senator Fate and Representative um, Hassan, uh, who... Uh, we're trying to improve the pay and, and benefits for Uber and Lyft drivers in the state. And that was the bill that it passed the House and the Senate, but the governor issued his one and only veto. Um, since yeah. five years as governor, um, he vetoed this bill uh, because, and the, one of the main reasons he vetoed the bill was because of uh, he, they were afraid that the dis that disability services were going to be impacted by the bill uh, for Uber and Lyft. And so he used 
uh, disability services as an, one of the reasons why he uh, vetoed that bill. And so it was, I would say, a little disappointing because, you know, Council on Disability, we weren't really consulted on it. It wasn't, I got a call from Senator Fate uh, very, like, almost an hour before the governor vetoed the bill saying, you know, why, why is the disability community against this bill? And in a large part had to do with the fact that in Dakota County, they partner with Lyft yes. to provide uh, service, to provide rides for people with disabilities, but not those with oh, who are wheelchair users. You know, right. that's one of the issues with the Uber and Lyft. They do not have wheelchair accessible vehicles. No. Um, it's something that we have been trying to, as you know, Mark, one of our priorities was expanding access to and improving the service for Metro Mobility. Um, and one of the things we tried about tried for years, tried to get the TNCs or transportation network companies like Uber and Lyft to provide accessible vehicles. And But Dakota County, it was partnering with Lyft to provide not accessible rides, but for rides for some people with disabilities. And the governor used that as a, one of the reasons why he vetoed the bill. Yeah. And so I'm hoping that next session we can use that as a talking point to really, you know, improve, talk to Uber and Lyft and say, you know, you're, you know, you got your, what you wanted, you got the bill vetoed, but you cited disabilities as one of the reasons. So hopefully you'd be willing to maybe invest sure. Yeah. Uh, and some accessible vehicle fleets if you're I, that concerned I, about people with disabilities. The, the caveat to that, Trevor, is you'll see that even though the governor did issue his one and only veto that he's ever issued in five years that he's been in office, is that he also required them to create a study that would allow them to um, to look at the study, the conditions relating to safety, and and um, and what I would call other benefits that Uber and Lyft drivers don't get because they use their own cars and those kind yep. of things. Absolutely. Um, one, once that study goes through and that study is required to be issued to the legislature by January, so it will be out before we even get Start. into next session, which starts yep. February, February 12th. Already, yep. uh, if you can believe it, I'm already planning <laughs> some things. I'm sure you already. are. Um, yep. for February already. So um, yeah. I, what I want to say is that even wow. though the veto happened, what what has caused that to happen is the study, and the study is really what's going to drive the momentum for next uh, year. I'm, I'm going to run this over, but I have a couple things to add quickly. I sure. talked to one of the drivers at uh, Transit Team, and he said that Lyft was trying to contact them to contract to do the Lyft wheelchair accessibility now. That isn't public, it isn't negotiated yet, but that's the offing. The other thing I want to talk about MetroBility, and I was really livid about this, is that on May 31st, I had to cancel my curbside because I had no groceries to bring home. And going to work and the operator, the reservations told me, well, it's company policy, they can't change the ride till I get in the bus at 9.30. As that has nothing to do with, so I called customer service and uh, they said there's no policy like that. So here I had a reservationist making up the rules as we're going along, and yeah. I won't tolerate that. Anyway, uh, thanks for being with us, Trevor. I wanted to put that out to you to see if the state council wants to mull that over and call me, and I'll tell you. And when we can act on it, I've uh, shot an email to Justin Page and Kelly Moeller and Frank Hornstein to let them know that I wasn't happy. So we'll talk soon. Thanks for being on Disability Viewpoints. And Joan Wilshire and Daryl will be right back with the next segment on the passage of marijuana at the state. We'll be right back with more Disability Viewpoints. Well, Minnesota has finally done it. They've legalized marijuana in the state of Minnesota. So what does this mean for people with disabilities in the state of Minnesota? Well, I've got three individuals here today as guests, and we're going to have a conversation about the bill that was just recently signed by Governor Walls. And we're going to talk about what impacts this might have on the disability community. So with me today, we've got Daryl Paulson. Um, he is a transit and disability specialist with Paulson & Company. Um, Marin Schrader, um, Policy Director um, for Sensible Change Minnesota, and then Lele Fatehe, 
Um, she is partner and principal of Apparatus GVC and Blunt Strategies. So welcome all three of you. Do we need to do a, like clapping and yay and yelling and screaming? You finally got it passed? No, we can, we can add those sound effects in uh, as we go through. <laughs> I mean, this is a long time coming for all of you, right? It is, it is. Um, and thank you to the uh, great ladies on the screen. Thank you for the work that you've done over the last several years um, and what this means to patients, what this means to people in Minnesota is it means that we all, have, we all have a quality product, safe and reliable, consistent product that we're currently using already. So well, let's talk about the legislation, jump into that and like what actually is going to happen? How soon will people have access to it? Um, how much can people grow and sell? Um, Lele, do you wanna jump in with some of those um, facts? Sure, so this bill legalizes the adult use, uh, meaning also recreational uh, cannabis in Minnesota. Um, you know, the first question a lot of people have is when are these products gonna be available on the market? When will dispensaries open? Um, well, first, the first thing that has to happen is the, the government has to create an office of cannabis management. It needs to do rulemaking uh, to set up the process by which it will accept applications and issue licenses um, to those businesses. The current timeline that we've seen uh, is looking like those dispensaries will be opening up in late 2024, early 2025. But the home grow provisions of the bill, and Minnesota is one of only 11 states uh, that allows home grow, those take effect August 1, and that allows people to grow uh, up to eight plants, up to four of which can be mature and flowering at any given time. Um, in their homes, so we do want to ensure people have the caveat that there will still be possession limits, um, and those are a uh, possession limit of two pounds that you can have at home. Uh, so people should be cognizant of that when they're doing their own home grow. But August 1 is also the date that the new uh, possession uh, limits take effect and uh, the automatic expungement of records begin for those who have criminal convictions, mm -hmm. uh, lower level for, for cannabis uh, possession crimes. Um, and yeah, we're pretty excited. Wow, it, that's fantastic. But it sounds like there's a wait time though where people are gonna be able to have access to it. So my wondering, what are people, are we gonna to have to be purchasing it the same way everyone's been doing it? What I can say, Joan, is that it's, it's gonna be no different than it is now. And for the medical side, the medical program will stay, will stay intact, mm -hmm. at, least, at least for, for the, you know, for the foreseeable future. Um, you know, we don't know what those changes will look like at some point. The new changes that we're excited about is it eliminates the, the registration fee, and it also, in 2025, it will go into effect, it will allow the, your, your doctor to certify you for a three year period instead of every year um, that it's currently been doing that. Sure. So, and for me, the expungement piece is really important as well, because it took me over 10 years to get an expungement for, for a quarter pound of pot that I, pled guilty for and basically designed my own punishment in the late 90s. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm really excited that those folks won't have to go through the, the 10 years that I had to go sure. through. It sounds like people are excited about the expungement piece and so forth, but um, what if, were some of the challenges though to get this through? I, Marin can speak to some of those things I believe as well. I mean, some of the things that we heard were they were worried about it would impact the low, the low level gummies and the low level THC edible products. And, and frankly, I mean, we haven't heard enough about this, but I will say this on camera publicly, the fastest growing population that is consuming ca cannabis today is senior citizens. So when I talk to seniors, they tell me every day, don't let the state get rid of our gummies. We want our gummies. And I'm saying, can you clarify okay. what gummies you're talking about? And they'll say, 
the THC marijuana gummies. So we need to clear, make sure we clearly send that message to care providers and other other facility um, makers that um, the seniors don't want those products to go away. Yeah, so having a DFL trifecta certainly helped the situation. Um, as many are aware, we passed a similar bill in the House in 2021 um, that was passed over to the Senate and left to die. Um, I think with a bill this size, the size alone was a challenge um, and just the work that it took to try to make it right. And then because this bill encompassed so many jurisdictions in so many areas, there were a lot of stakeholders and trying to manage stakeholders was one of my roles um, through this, at least allied stakeholders, those that were supportive of the bill. How does our legislation now that's passed in law, how does it um, compare um, to other states? I think we created a really unique licensing structure um, and focus as to smaller businesses. And especially we created a mid-tier license that is not big cannabis, but it's also not a tiny operation. And that's called the Mezzo license. Um, I, I'm really excited about that. And then Minnesota takes a lot of heat for how bad our medical cannabis program is um, and has been over the years with the limited uh, providers and affordability and accessibility. But one thing that has held true since the bill was passed, and I know Daryl worked on this, is we have really strong civil patient protections, um, anti-discrimination provisions. And we were able in this bill to include an attorney's fees uh, provision as well as statutory jam damages uh, for patients that have had their, that have been discriminated against by landlords, employers, healthcare providers, et cetera. Um, so I think really shoring that up makes us definitely mm -hmm. a unique place in the country for, for patient protection. Sure. You know, I guess when you're looking at recreational marijuana versus um, the medicinal, are they equal in no, terms of? Absolutely not. Um, the medical side, I will say that there's 40,000 people and roughly about 40,000 <laughs> people enroll, enrolled in our medical program. Um, I think uh, the recreational adult use cannabis will only will only increase that once we start to roll out some education and some understandings of the difference between adult use cannabis and medical cannabis. I think you'll you'll start to see both of those numbers greatly increase once once the Office of Medical Cannabis is open in July. You'll you'll start to see an influx of educational stuff come out. Mm -hmm. I believe at the end of the year as well, you know. Because the point of controversy has often been around adult use versus, you know, medical um, that politically is less controversial as a concept, a lot of the testimony that was being heard in committee really centered around adult use because that was the more politically challenging and just the new law. Right. Um, but there was considerable work being done on the medical provisions, both by MN is Ready, which is the um, coalition that Marin and I were directing, especially Marin uh, was really a leader in advancing um, some of the good provisions that were adopted there. And then, of course, the medical cannabis companies, those two companies, they uh, have their own lobbying teams as well that have pre-established relationships um, with legislators, and they certainly were a part sure. of the conversation, too. Well, one thing we haven't talked about real quickly here is the stigma. Is there stigma? It seems like, you know, it should be less now that the bill has been passed and it's legal. Um, but I, I think, I think, you know, Joan, I think the stigma still exists, you know, in, in certainly communities that are more conservative than others. But I think it really boils down to educational and it boils down to a community sense of attitudinal change. We've got to get out there. We've mm -hmm. got to show people in the public that cannabis users are not scary. They're not lawbreakers. They're actually productive citizens of society. And 
once we change those attitudinal attitudinal barriers that we have in the community, mm -hmm. I think you'll see cannabis sure. flourish in Minnesota and the people that are behind it will flourish as well. I actually think one of the coolest pieces of Minnesota's law is our hemp law um, with the edibles and beverages being available everywhere. Um, I think that that's actually gonna increase the, how fast, I think it's mm -hmm. gonna make it faster yeah. um, to decrease that right. stigma. You know, you can walk into a liquor store and buy THC seltzer next to alcoholic seltzer. Yeah. And so that in and of itself is normalization right. of, of consumption. Fantastic. I will say we've got the phone number up for the new um, state department that was created for the Department of Cannabis. Um, we'll have that running up on the screen here so people can contact them if they have further questions. But thanks um, for all three of you for coming on board and um, congratulations on finally getting this through um, for all the, the state of Minnesota. Well, thank you, Joan, and thank you to the ladies joining us on the screen. Um, much work. I, I love you both. Um, I'll find something for you guys to do next year, so <laughs> hang in there. We'll be talking. So. Thanks. We'll be right back after these messages. A lawyer, a teacher, a warehouse worker, a fitness instructor, a software engineer. What do all these people have in common? Well, they are all Minnesotans who are blind, deaf blind, or visually impaired heading to their jobs every day. State Services for the Blind, or SSB, helps blind, deaf blind, and visually impaired Minnesotans create a path to reach their career and employment goals. That might mean learning the skills of living well with vision loss, getting training in technology, developing a resume, finding an open position, or working with an employer to figure out some job accommodations. At SSB, customers set their career goals and we provide training and resources to help Minnesotans achieve those goals. An accountant, a baker, an office manager, a small business owner, a customer service rep, an architect. Blind, deaf blind, and visually impaired Minnesotans are hard at work in all these careers and lots more too. If you have vision loss and are looking for work or looking to advance in your career, just give us a call at 651-539-2300 or visit mnssb.org. State Services for the Blind, Independence, Equality, Opportunity, Achievement. Well, as always, I'm Mark Hughes. Thanks for watching Disability Viewpoints. We hope you'll watch again next time. We had a busy half hour, a lot of stuff at the legislature going on at the House and Senate as we closed the session for this year. But on February 12th of 2024, we'll do it all over again. Joan and how? How did your segment have today? It was absolutely fabulous. We learned so much about the new cannabis legislation and it's gonna be an exciting um, couple of years as this moves forward um, with people being able to access both recreational and uh, medical um, marijuana. Yeah, it's a really big move for Minnesota. Daryl, do you wanna say a couple words while we wrap this up? It's a big move for Minnesota tremendously in, in the cannabis world, but more importantly, it's it's big for Minnesota families, you know. This year at the le at the legislature, the governor and le the legislature, the senators included, have made significant investments for families in Minnesota. And again, as always, thanks for watching. Thanks to the team at SPNN, and we'll see you soon. Bye for now. <laughs>